Well, welcome. Uh, as Joel mentioned, I am Paul Karp, Director of Research at GreenBiz, and it's my honor to have two esteemed commissioners here with us today. Um, and I will start with uh, Commissioner Eccles on the right here, a two-time elected far public right. utilities. That would be the far right. The far right, thank you. Uh, <laughs> Good correction. Two-time elected uh, commissioner from the far right, uh, Commissioner Eccles, uh, representing the second district of, uh, of the state of Georgia, just east of Atlanta. Uh, he is an advocate. I thought you were going to tell him where Georgia was, and I was getting a little worried. I think we know generally where it is. Uh, he is an advocate for energy efficiency, for renewable energy, and electric vehicles. Uh, and speaking of energy, he also has seven children. Mm. Um, on the near right, or I guess to his left, we have uh, President Picker. Uh, this is Michael Picker from the California Public Utilities Commission. Welcome to California. Thanks. It's <laughs> a great place. Yeah. I can see why you, know, why you would want to live here. You can walk barefoot at night after you. I am walking from my hotel, which is 2.1 miles from here, over here, because that's the best alternative fuel you can have, right? Uh, so, so I'm as, really As you can that. tell. Thank you. As you can tell, these commissioners have a history together, and uh, we're going to get into a story about them both being expelled from Germany uh, shortly. Um, Much to the credit of the Germans. Mm. So first, I'd like to turn to Commissioner Eccles, and uh, in light of the recent hurricanes in, uh, in, in your part of the country, including Hurricane Irma, which um, a devastated part of your, your state. Uh, tell us about the recovery efforts and what do we need to do to make a more resilient electric grid? Yeah, you know, usually when we have a, a weather-related issue, it's either tropical storm related on the coast at Savannah or in Atlanta with some kind of ice storm in the winter. This impacted every county that Georgia Power was in. We had almost a million Georgia Power customers out, uh, about another half a million EMC customers out, and uh, Georgia Power, to their credit, they got 95% of them back on in four days. Uh, so it was a Herculean effort. Uh, certainly, you know, proud of uh, the, the company and the other, other states, even Hydro uh, Quebec sent some folks in. California uh, sent uh, some folks in because our typical friends that helped us were in Florida, helping, helping the Floridians. So it, it did put us in a bind, uh, I think the last hurricane that came through was about 100 million, and we're going to be well, well north of that. So it, it was, um, it was substantial. And you know, whenever this happens, I have constituents who hit me up on Twitter, and you can see my uh, Twitter, Twitter handle there, who say, "Why don't you just bury all the lines? You know, this this would solve all the problem with the pine trees falling on the lines, and it's just so expensive." to do, I, I, just, I just don't see how we could really ever do that. One of the challenges with undergrounding power lines and, uh, and telecommunications is that it actually doesn't protect you in the case of certain natural disasters. So the experience in Sandy was that the areas in Long Island that had poles were back in service within about a week or two. The areas that had their utility infrastructure undergrounded were out of service for as long as three months. So what happens, particularly when you have sheet flooding, you get ponding water, you get uh, infiltration into the, to the vaults, you got to dig the whole thing up. So I'm a big fan of poles. We have 4.2 million poles here in the state of California. Poles connect every home in the state. They connect every small business. Um, there are some uh, undergrounded uh, uh, infrastructure, but I think that's a problem in the future. If you look at a pole, the top currently is electricity. Below that is usually the legacy copper wire for telephony. Maybe below that is the, the legacy cable uh, company. Then you have the, the fiber that provides new VOIP for telephony by AT&T or Verizon, and then it has, uh, has uh, cable as well as uh, internet. Below that's the cable company's cable that has, uh, has uh, content and, uh, and internet and telephone service, um, and sometimes actually provides home energy management. So if you look at a pole, it's probably the most computation out in the field you'll see anywhere. It's pro each poll probably carries more data than was, was, was sent throughout the U.S. in the year 1970. 
Wow. So it's fairly high tech. It is the connection. And when 5G comes, that's a broadcast technology. It has a range of about 300 feet. It's going to service autonomous vehicles. It's going to provide much faster uh, uh, mobile uh, connectivity. If you don't have that broadcast, and you need 20 times as many nodes as you do for cell, if you don't have that, those poles, you're stringing on buildings. If your utility infrastructure is undergrounded, you can't get access to electricity, you can't get access to fiber, you may actually find that cities that have undergrounded fairly significantly, like San Francisco, are the last to actually have 5G just because of the challenge of mounting the transmission nodes on buildings, getting down to the electricity and to the fiber. And See, that's why I hang out with him, <laughs> right? Uh, because of all this all this extra knowledge stuff always that learn he has. something and yeah. i have a new business model where i will sell you your own wooden pole huh you will own your own wooden pole you will get to establish your own personal tariffs to make those telecom companies actually pay you to have access to you and your neighbors so it's kind of like a sponsor like you're <laughs> you get to sponsor a pole or something no it's like nem for poles I think, I, okay. I, you can I, be the solar city of Georgia see? telephone poles. I've never seen nope. two commissioners trying to sell each other on infrastructure, but this is, this is intriguing. We're, uh, we're all about big, long-lived infrastructure. If you want to get 4.2 million wooden poles to connect every household in a state the size of California, you need a monopoly to do it. When I go back to Georgia and they ask me, what did you learn at that Verge conference? Uh, and polls, uh, people are going to be very disappointed. Well, well, let me let me intervene here. So, on the topic of infrastructure, uh, Commissioner Eccles, we heard from the visionary team that led uh, the project called the Ray, which is the 16-mile stretch of IT-enabled uh, highway in your state. What is the importance of, of of smart infrastructure and smart cities in your state? You know, I, I like what uh, Harriet and Allie. Are y'all out here? Just yell if you're here. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, so we've got two Georgia Bells here, and I, I hope you've had a chance to, to, to meet them because they, they are not only smart, but they're extremely professional in how they interacted with our commission. Um, but, you know, they took an 18-mile stretch of highway named after Harriet's dad, and they set about to make it a laboratory uh, and, you know, to do all kind of cool things like the, the French uh, at the at the welcome station so that you actually drive over solar panels and their wheelwright gizmo in the back where you can drive your car, car through it and go to the kiosk and it tells you the air pressure in your tires and, and, and what the tread depth uh, was uh, to the motion that I made in the IRP to add a megawatt of solar in the right of way there. Uh, so there's a lot of really cool things going on and I, I like the idea of experimenting and doing R&D uh, one in a limited area and, and I like the idea of having a foundation like theirs, bringing a whole pot of money with them, you know, and working almost in like a public-private partnership with a state agency because it's less burden. It's, it's more skin in the game for more people. So I really think it's a great model. Great. So uh, now we're going to turn to how the two of you met. And I want to hear the story about the delegation in Germany. Uh, President Picker, do you want to kick this off? Uh, Tim and I met a number of years ago when we were actually visiting Germany, and I was very interested in learning how they were managing the high levels of renewables that they had uh, built and, uh, and a little bit about how they were pricing it. And uh, Tim was there, and he was actually very interested in how they were um, um, actually developing diversity amongst resources and particularly concerned about uh, the shutdown of nuclear power. It was after Fukushima. It was right it was after, after Fukushima. Right after mm -hmm. Fukushima. Mm -hmm. And so I, I kept at trying to get a better understanding of what kind of tools they had for data analytics. I was really, I was, con I was curious as to why they had decided not to do smart meters or smart, smart inverters for all the, the solar arrays that they had. They had no communication uh, as to what was happening behind the meter, despite a lot of, uh, of uh, distributed uh, generation. And they just told me that there was no business case for smart inverters or smart meters. 
And I think that over time they learned that, uh, that maybe they should actually start to think about how millions of different panels start to ha affect the nature of your electric system and the fact that, that you're seeing a whole range of new kinds of phenomenon as you have a, a, a very dynamic distributed thin grid as opposed to the big bulk grid that they really kind of thought about the most. And I was just aghast that they were going to exit uh, nuclear power, uh, you know, because, I mean, the Germans are great engineers. I felt like if anyone in the world should be handling nuclear power plants, it should be the Germans. But after Fukushima, it was like, uh, it, it was like all five of the major political parties, you know, it, it had decided we're, you know, it's over. We're going to shut these, I guess, eight plants down immediately, and then we're going to exit the rest of them 2022. We're going to strand the assets. Uh, we're going to make the utilities pay for them. I, I just couldn't believe the way that they were treating the utilities because I, I'm from a state where the utility is, you know, is in every Rotary Club, every Kiwanis Club, giving to practically every charity in the state, on every chamber board. I mean, they're like this incredible corporate citizen, and I can't imagine, you know, cutting them off at the knees. And, the, and, and I just felt like, you know, I talked to members of the Bundestag or the Congress there, and it's like, well, they've made enough money. Huh? You know, I, I just couldn't believe that. And so I, I went back. The trip had a substantial impact on me because I went back and I said, I want the power company at the table when we do solar. And so Commissioner McDonald and Commissioner Everett and I, you know, voted to require the power company to add 525 megawatts that next year. And the power company didn't want to do it. They said, we don't need any solar. And in a matter of like two minutes, you know, they were going to have to have 525 megawatts. And uh, Commissioner McDonald had been to Germany in the same year. And I think that the, the Germans had done such a good job of putting so much out there. And they did, you know, employ their great engineering skills with that. And it was a lot for us to learn. I just didn't want to do it the same way. Great. We're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about California. So the California state legislature uh, recently shot down a bill for 100% renewable portfolio standard. And uh, the question to you, President Picker, is, uh, you know, in light of that, are we moving fast enough and what needs to happen to fully decarbonize? Well, uh, several years ago, the legislature handed us a slightly different task, which was to begin to measure greenhouse gas reductions in the electric industry. And uh, so what, what we know now is that, that while SB 100 would have required us to be at 60% renewables by 2030, the, the greenhouse gas modeling to reach our 2030 goal also probably requires us to be slightly above 60%. So to some extent, this is, the task has already been set for us. But what SB 350 did that's more important is it started us on a trajectory of, of measuring greenhouse gas reductions and actually specifically required us to begin uh, electrification of transportation. So if you look at what's happening in California, 20% of our carbon emissions budget comes from the electric industry. It's actually fairly clean at this point. Most of the utilities are right at about 40% renewables or will be by 2020, the year we expected to be, to be at 30%. 30% of our carbon emissions comes from the use of natural gas. 40% comes from transportation. So to get to our 2030 goal, you could go to 100% and still fail to get to the GHG goal. You know, so, th this is what I heard the Germans say this spring at the Berlin Energy Transition Dialogue. Yeah. Michael, they said that exact same thing. They said, we've got enough renewable energy in the ground with our, in our, with our wind and our solar. We need to decarbonize transportation. So they changed their mind about that because in 2012, when you and I were there, they were like, who would want an electric car, right? Uh, you know, we drive fast on the Autobahn and we like to change gears. It's like, we don't need electric cars. And now all of a sudden, they want to decarbonize transportation and energy efficiency. And you're, that, that's what y'all were talking about here in California too, yeah, isn't And it? I actually heard that you have a manufacturing plant to uh, help build manage the, the, the port parts for German electric vehicles in Georgia, so. And in and, uh, and German, um, when uh, uh, gearboxes for wind turbines as well. Well, so so it is. It is. People are starting to see the same kinds of trends. I mean, the, if the goal is greenhouse gas emissions, 
renewables are not enough. And we've also, we've also discovered in the West, at least, the renewables aren't as, as difficult a task as we want. So now the challenge is how do you use the economic mass of the electric utilities and their the ability to accumulate capital and to get to scale quickly to take market share and reduce greenhouse gas emission in the gas industry and to begin to electrify transportation and reduce carbon in that industry. So this is probably the central topic for the PUC, which is rapidly becoming an agency that builds the infrastructure to get carbon out of the California economy. So maybe there aren't so many differences between red states and blue states that we've seen here. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Elaine at the sidebar to see if we have any questions over there. Yeah, so one question. We have a lot of technology companies here that are seeking to uh, expand their data centers and you know, a lot of the renewable energy expansion. And so it's the theoretical question. Say I'm going to site a huge renewably powered data center. Why should I put it in your state, Georgia versus California? Yeah, so we would, uh, we would love to have that 100 megawatt data center and, and have a 100 megawatt backup for that. Uh, and, you know, there's a, there's a couple reasons. One, our energy rates are 13% below the national average, right? So money, money does matter. And we're in a growth mode with solar right now. Uh, so, you know, where Cal California, you guys aren't really procuring renewable energy now. We are. We're, uh, uh, we're, we approved 1.6 gigawatts at the last IRP in 2016. So uh, if a company wants to come to Georgia, then, you know, we can, uh, you know, we have a special tariff for them to be able to take advantage of that. And we can provide gas backup for uh, their generators. Uh, you know, there's a lot of creative things and, you know, we can help them meet their sustainability goal goals and save money at the same time. So. California, I think what we offer is certainty and reliability. You have a pretty good sense that the systems are in place to both help you with the utility side of the, of the renewable uh, debate, whether you're going to procure it yourself and wheel it over the utility lines or whether you're going to actually buy it from a utility or a third-party provider. And then, frankly, we have the reliability services that actually help. If you're a data server company and you're serving retail, for example, and you're targeting those, uh, those critical um, uh, buying seasons like Christmas or, or Easter or back to school, you can't afford to have outages. That one weekend can be as much as 20% of your annual revenues. So I think that we've been thinking a lot about how you marry renewables and light reliability. I think we, the most recent test of our success is that we got through with the largest renewable uh, uh, solar portfolio in the, in the country, we got through the, the solar eclipse without a bobble. Great, Elaine, time for one more question. Yeah, we've got a, a few students here, several students here. Um, what's your advice to them as to whether they should get into the energy business? Become a, a line worker on an electric utility. There's going to be a need for those poles. They're the most hotly co uh, contested piece of infrastructure in the United States. There's bu they're busily trying to preempt local controls in, in, at, at the FCC. Um, Google, for example, could not actually string fiber here in Silicon Valley because the poles are currently so crowded. So there's going to be a great career path for people who learn how to maximize the productivity of those wooden poles. You know, it's, it's good to learn a skill, right? I mean, like, you know, a, a reactor out at Plant Vo I mean, a welder at Plant Vogel makes more than a history major or English major from my university, unfortunately. So, you know, learn a skill, learn to work hard, uh, have good manners, um, you know, as we would say in the South. That's why I'm a commissioner. Yeah. And if you can be a commissioner, definitely be a commissioner. I mean, that's, you know, it's the coolest <laughs> job. But you don't have to have manners. I, I do. <laughs> Stick around, we'll fix it. Oh, okay. Great, well with that, I think that's a perfect conclusion to our session here. Please join me in thanking uh, President Picker and uh, Commissioner Tim Eccles. Thanks,